on behalf of the center of research in emerging economics let me welcome everybody to the second lecture of our inter of our inspirational inspiration series i'm sorry uh, to be delivered by dr maitresh ghatak from and the london school of economics and political science before i request our dean dr rajesh chakravarty to introduce dr ghatak and take it over let me just quickly introduce to the students and everybody here the members of our center dr chitrakalpa sen dr suganna balakumar dr brajesh kumar dr anjuman antil dr ashim talukdar and dr chitresh kumar we have a couple of more members who will be joining very shortly and i will introduce them after the lecture maybe as we go along but without further ado let me request our dean dr rajesh chakravarty to take this forward introduce dr ghatak and start moderating the session thank you very much and thank you very much dr ghatak for accepting our invitation to deliver a talk in the inspiration series i look forward to it thank you over to you dr chakravarty thank you anirban good evening everyone it is my distinct pleasure and honor to introduce professor maitresh ghatak i have been privileged to know him for a long while now i was actually a couple of years junior to him in college but at that time i don't think we were we were uh, we knew each other that well but i've had the privilege of knowing him personally and over the years at intervals so it's great to see you again maitresh and welcome to jindal global business school even if uh, in an online mode only so the uh, the uh, professor ghatak hardly needs any introduction to this group but i will nevertheless uh the short introduction of his that i picked up online so professor ghatak is one of the leading researchers in the world in uh, development economics and uh, he has a he has an ma in economics from delhi school of economics and phd in economics from harvard university he has taught before at university of chicago and uh, before moving to london school of economics where he is currently uh, currently a professor he has where he has taught since 2002 he has held visiting positions at the institute for advanced study in princeton yale university northwestern and the, and indian uh, statistical institute kolkata is currently a co-editor of economica a former managing editor of the review of economic studies former editor in chief of the journal of development economics and a former co-editor of the economics of transition he directs the research group uh, economic organization and public policy at the lse is the lead economist of the dfid funded international growth centers india bihar program and a board member of the bureau for uh, research in the economic analysis of development also known as the bred He writes occasional essays in various newspapers, magazines. In addition to his more serious research, and these are on economic and political issues in English as well as in Bengali. In July 2018, he was a fellow of the British Academy. So, without further ado, I would request Professor Gatta to talk about reframing the role of income transfers in India's anti-poverty strategy. Sorry about that. Thank you. no worries all yours thank you very much uh, thank you uh, dr shen for the invitation and thank you um, uh, rajesh who i know for a long time indeed from our college days and i have gotten to know him more um, you know later uh, in our overlaps in the indian school of business hyderabad and, and various other places so um i am um delighted to be able to join you today um i i i hope that what i say um i hope it 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 fits with the billing of the program of the inspiration series but at least if i can offer you some food for thought uh, that's the bar i'm setting for myself and that we have a, a interesting and productive discussion so uh let me just turn on the share screen and So yeah I 
The title of the talk specifically is on the design of a safety net for the poor, but uh, what um, um, Professor Chakraborty said is, is correct, that the paper that I had uh, planned to base my talk mainly was my paper on the inclusive growth dividend. But given all that has been happening over the last, um, whatever, half, half a year now, uh, in, including some of the challenges of um, various economic packages and their uh, linkages and, and various uh, frictions that we are discovering, it seemed it is only appropriate that uh, to speak on this subject, uh, I would want to uh, put our, my earlier work on the inclusive growth dividend with um, Karthik Muralitharan of um, UCST in this larger frame of the challenges of design of safety net for the poor. So this talk is on joint work with Parikshit Ghosh of Delhi School of Economics. Again, um, uh, uh, we are contemporaries uh, along with uh, Rajesh Chakrabutti from Presidency College of Eeyore, which is now Presidency University. Um, and uh, also with Karthik Murali Dharan uh, that I already mentioned. So I speak, plan to speak for about 35 minutes or so, and then uh, leave the rest of the time for questions and answers. And what I want to really do is a very kind of big picture framing of the issue. So for example, you could argue that, hey, of all the problems, economic problems that are out there, why do you particularly want to focus on poverty? Of course, you may have kind of humanitarian reasons for doing so, and I hope that is indeed the case. But Suppose we take it more from a more abstract public policy or development economics point of view of all the various economic metrics or indicators that we could think of, why, why do we focus on poverty? I'm going to make a couple of cases which may be well known to you or um, many of you have may perhaps thought about it. But since this is an attempt to give an overall framework to the design of safety net for the poor, I hope you don't mind any, anything that, that sounds kind of somewhat straightforward. So the first and foremost reason for focusing on poverty is that is the you know, living condition or that's the reality of a vast majority of people. So therefore, if you want to talk about say the economic problem of India or, or economic problem in the developing world, whichever way you frame it, uh, you, in some ways, there has to be some overlap with the economic problems faced by the poor. So therefore, you know, in, uh, from that very almost statistical point of view, it's not a bad starting point as opposed to, say, growth rates and some of the other indicators, uh, economic development indicators. Indeed, if you look at the even the modest Rangarajan Committee poverty line, um, you would basically find that uh, uh, is, uh, using some of the NSS numbers, both the previous one and that came, came out recently, and then uh, uh, there has been some uh, uh, debates around it. Uh, I would say a fair estimate is about one third of uh, the population uh, would be strictly below this poverty line, uh, subject to various statistical issues. But what's interesting is that even if you take uh, this kind of a general estimate um, and leave aside the question whether there has been an increase in poverty uh, even before the COVID crisis hit or not, even if you park that particular issue, the interesting thing is that if you just take double this poverty line, which still is a pretty um, um, you know, um, small amount of money, if you look at the monthly per capita expenditure level of about a thousand rupees, uh, on average, uh, twice that would be rough, roughly less than 2,000 rupees, more than 70% Indians would be under this. So therefore, it is uh, compelling uh, in terms of um, uh, why we should kind of focus on problems that the poor face, and then, of course, the safety net design issues. Now, this is more, uh, you could say, a statistical argument that if you want to study a problem, well, study those who seem to have, have the problem or are symptomatic of the problem itself. But in a more, anyway, so, sorry for the interruption. So if you now take a more conceptual point of view in terms of what is the connection about, you know, the broad development economics framework that whether we should be focusing on per capita income, growth, etc. 
You can also see that from a conceptual point of view, it's compelling to study um, uh, the um, uh, determinants as well as potential solutions to the problem of poverty. Because if you think about conceptually, poverty is the lack of development. In some ways, it's the stunting of potential of human beings. And if you aggregate up, therefore, you know, villages and cities and economies, because to the extent there are um, what uh, you could say that natural um, uh, pr productive potential that individuals have, having a lot of poor people would essentially means that they are somehow below what uh, that could be, they could put, be potentially achieving both for themselves as well as uh, for, for, for the economy as a whole. And therefore, both for reasons of equity and efficiency, you should be uh, concerned with the problem of poverty. And indeed, what this to me is therefore a core uh, approach I take to development economics, and this informs a lot of my uh, thinking on uh, policy as well, that poverty is stunting a potential, whether of individuals or economies, and therefore we can think of various policies as to trying to push the constrained potential, or if we want to use a more economic, uh, sort of standard economic terminology of the production possibilities frontier from its constrained form uh, and kind of relax the set of constraints and therefore uh, make a better match between what is real and what is potential. So I want to, oh, sorry, one second. Now, why is, you know, why do we even bother about safety net and some of these issues? Why shouldn't we just focus on growth itself? And again, I, for now, it might seem uh, strange to discuss this in the post-COVID situation where our growth rate is uh, right now, we should be talking about rates of contraction rather than growth. But, and I will come to some of the COVID specific issues, but here I'm taking a more long-term or general approach to policy here. Now, the thing is, of course, growth is necessary. In the end, you need to have a larger pie to be able to distribute it in any way that the policymaker might want. But it is not sufficient, though. Just to give you an example of numerical example, that if you take, for example, the dream growth rate of 10%, which clearly is a distant dream at this point, if you do some simple arithmetic based on very publicly available numbers, it'll take more than a quarter of century of sustained growth of 10% per year of incomes, and which, for example, no country in history has had quarter century of sustained double digit growth, to bring an individual who's right now uh, on the poverty line up to merely the current level of per capita income, which itself is meager by global standards. So this is a simple arithmetic exercise, and one can do many such um, uh, different exercises. Uh, but the main point here, though, is therefore to mm. say that we just so it, it basically means that you, you, you cannot quite rely on growth alone in terms of how to deal with the problem of poverty. Now, what are the broad class of anti-poverty policies and where do the safety net and of which the inclusive growth dividend that uh, is uh, one of the key things that I want to talk about fit in? Now, there are two broad categories of anti-poverty policies. One is policies that directly promote growth and generate employment, rising wage incomes, plus more tax revenue that can vary as welfare policies, that kind of the growth approach. And that of course is a, a clear direct pathway to reducing poverty. But there's also policies that are directly targeted to the poor, which would en enable the poor greater access to markets. So you can think of this as various forms of you know, training, microcredit, various types of programs uh, that allow uh, poor better access to markets. Similarly, better access to public services and infrastructure, investing in training and skill formation, safety net. I'll come back in detail about this uh, in, in a few minutes, as well as explicit redistribution of income and assets. Okay, so these are the broad policies. Now, if we focus on the narrower set of policies that would constitute a safety net, okay, what would these be? So there are three distinct purposes behind the various welfare schemes. And now I'm actually gonna move from the very conceptual um, or abstract point of view from which I started to specific policies of, of the government of India in terms of various categories of expenditure that would uh, relate to the safety net. 
So income redistribution in normal times, which could be various forms of taxation, means tested benefits, you know, uh, subsidies, et cetera, and concrete examples would be the public distribution system or PDS or cash transfers. Various social insurance against idiosyncratic shocks. These are shocks that face individuals, not necessarily for the whole economy. And these are also for specific groups, such as elderly folks, you know, pension would be an issue, for women expecting children, maternity benefits would be issues. So uh, we can think of broadly these as idiosyncratic needs for which uh, the poor might need a uh, safety net. And for example, uh, employment guarantee of which the MG Nareg, uh, um, uh, you know, Narega or uh, Manrega as, as it is called, which refers to the employment guarantee scheme, these are examples of. But then there are also macro shocks, and we are living through one of the most severe macro shocks that the Indian economy has faced ever in our history, uh, the pandemic and the lockdown, uh, that what has essentially caused the economic um, um, severe contraction that we are going through. And there also, there would be some forms of insurance, uh, for example, disaster relief, um, COVID-related measures, some of the special measures that were announced. So if we look at actual expenditure patterns, so this is where um, uh, in the ongoing work with Borikit Ghosh that I mentioned, we, we did a fair bit of um, uh, um, um, kind of looking at numbers. Um, and if you look at just the budget document of 2018-19, uh, I will mention the categories in a second. In fact, I will let me show you maybe the sequence and this would be better. So suppose we create this following categories of income redistribution, social insurance, human capacity development or human development, relief for macroeconomic shocks, residual categories of welfare and, 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 and kind of, you know, um, uh, various uh, insurance and, and protection schemes, as well as physical infrastructure. Suppose these are, you know, one, two, three, four, five, and six. If you quickly eyeball it, and let me just, if you ignore the lax crows and those kind of you know, big numbers and just look at percentages, clearly the big items are number one, number three, and then two and six are tied. So what's number one? Number one is income distribution. What's number three? That's human capacity de development, health, education, sanitation. Number two and number six are tied. Number two is social insurance and number six is physical infrastructure. And clearly the other amounts, for example, the uh, shocks relating to macroeconomic shocks, it's a relatively small amount that we see here, okay? Now I could talk a lot about uh, some of these categories and indeed getting our wrapping our head around the various categories that exist and coming up with a systematic scheme itself is useful. But in the interest of time and also to keep the conversation focused more on the conceptual um, and, and kind of policy questions, I will skip some of the details, but you will have access to some of the details of how we classified the various uh, categories of expenditure. Uh, which you know involves income dis redistribution, uh, social insurance, human capacity building, relief for macroeconomic shocks, physical infrastructure, and various residuals. Okay, which includes environment and other kinds of you know um, um, sort of development expenditure. Now, given this broad picture and the plethora of various schemes that we have and going back to the initial discussion we had about what is the problem that the poor face what should public policy do about it how it is connected to the broader development objective of the country i want to in the kind of main body of my lecture today focus on a couple of broad themes about how should we try to reform the safety net Okay, and by the way, if there is any clarifying question while I'm speaking, please um, feel free to uh, ask it and I'm sure um, the uh, chair um, will, will allow any clarifying question, but of course more open-ended questions or, or, or kind of um, uh, speculative questions, those can be left for after I'm done with the main presentation. So I basically want to make three broad um, sort of sets of points regarding given the overall picture of you know the safety net that as it exists in India uh, I want to make kind of three 
proposals, you can say, or three uh, kind of you know, conceptual points that relate to how the safety net should be reformed uh, coming from my point of view. So the first is I would advocate greater use of unconditional income transfers. Uh, this is uh, certainly not an uncontroversial uh, uh, policy I, uh, that, that I'm pushing, but uh, especially since the COVID crisis has hit, I've had many former critiques of uh, these kind of uh, uh, unconditional cash transfers, which is sometimes referred to as universal basic income, uh, have come around given some of the specific challenges that the COVID crisis has, has thrown up as to being more supportive of such policies. And I will talk a bit about uh, what uh, those immediate contexts of the COVID crisis and how it changes some of our thinking on this. But basically the main argument, and I will list some of those uh, in, 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 in when I discuss this, as to some of the streamlining of the various kinds of transfer schemes and lumping them in the form of an unconditional income transfer is something that will help both from the point of view of equity and efficiency. Okay. However, I think a lot of the debate that happens, some, somehow uh, people put this as kind of a zero one thing that if you advocate a universal basic income or some variant of it, whichever you call it, we prefer to call it an inclusive growth dividend uh, based on what I'm gonna uh, sort of talk about uh, right now. But the point is though, as much as when you're treating a patient, you do not focus on any particular you know, medicine, especially if the patient is, has several things that are not working out. So similarly, if you think about the economy, there's never one magic bullet that will solve all problems. That cannot be growth, but not cannot be just an income transfer and being done with it. So of course, what we kind of said, you know, and, and that is something that has to be uh, kept in mind in any of the discussions around this, is we say that uh, a case for having a direct income transfer, an unconditional one, should be part of a portfolio of policies, but that of course means that there will be other components to this portfolio. Now in particular, there should be some recognition of the needs of the fact that there is heterogeneity of needs and situations and therefore there could be specific transfers whether income or in kind for specific groups and indeed there are specific market failures that would need uh, some specific intervention. So this is to say we would uh, argue in favor of a more unconditional income transfer policy. I think that is kind of the, if you honestly ask my gut feeling about it, that is the kind of uh, general direction of how things are moving anyway uh, across the world in India as well to some degree. And I do think this force will only be strengthened. Uh, and here, of course, I make uh, the case for it. The second and interesting point that I want to make, uh, and I, I, I hope um, you, you find uh, this point worth thinking about, is it is important not just to say that, hey, you should not reduce all aspects of a portfolio of uh, social safety net for the poor or more broadly uh, anti-poverty policies into a single magic bullet, whether it's cash transfer or something, that's sort of point one. You should think of the portfolio. But these are not independent numbers you're putting into the various uh, um, boxes of this portfolio. You know, of course, there's an underlying budget constraint. So that's a clear interdependence all these policies would have because the sum total of this has to you know, um, um, uh, satisfy the government budget constraint. But there might be interesting synergies and complementarities between some of these uh, policies. And therefore, some of the debates that we see that kind of go a, a bit head to head in terms of you know, either A or B are a bit misguided. So that's the second point I want to make. The third point I want to make is the COVID crisis itself has thrown up a number of uh, lessons for us. One lesson that I want to focus on is actually a very old debate that you know somehow dogs development economists at, at, at large and also in the context of India are what are sometimes informally called the cash wallers versus the PDS wallers. And somehow these are policies that either you do this ration system of food distribution or you do cash transfer. 
but you could actually make the case, and I do in, 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 in um, what follows, is that the, actually the COVID crisis has thrown up an interesting policy lesson that at least in certain contexts, there are strong complementarities between the public distribution system and cash transfers. So uh, just to keep an eye on the time, so Rajesh, I have about 15 minutes or so. Sure, yes. Okay. Yeah, that will leave us uh, about 20 minutes or 20, 25 minutes of Q&A, right? Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm now first going to talk uh, to make a bit of case for the uh, unconditional cash transfer that I pointed earlier uh, to you. Uh, and indeed, was my initial plan of what would have formed the full, full lecture on, but here it's going to be part of this broader discussion. So what um, Karthik Muralidharan and I have written a detailed paper on this and that's available on my website and it's forthcoming in the India Policy Forum collected papers is basically fixing a certain percentage of nominal GDP per capita and we propose a specific number of 1% given fiscal realities that we have. And again, these are pre-COVID pre fiscal realities. The post-COVID fiscal realities are of course uh, uh, order of magnitude harder. These are to be paid at the individual as opposed to the household level, okay? And it would be basically uh, deposited on a regular basis as opposed to a one-time kind of transfer. So that's basically our policy. What is it? I mean, why, why, why give it a different fancy name uh, compared to universal basic income? Well, for the following reason, that it is a percentage of GDP and not some absolute amount. So that's one reason. The second, what the term inclusive growth dividend suggests is the following, that it's merely a dividend because anytime you say universal basic income, there's a presumption that as if that money will be enough to meet a person's all uh, their expenses. Whereas with the inclusive growth dividend, it simply says that as the country grows, there'll be more resources available and you can get more out of that. But broadly speaking, this is just a component to your income. It is as if you own something and you're getting some dividends, um, you know, as if you are a stakeholder in the economy and you're receiving some transfer as a um, basis of that. Now, some of the desirabilities of uh, uh, this kind of uh, unconditional uh, income transfers are well known. So I will not perhaps go through as much detail on them uh, as I want to spend on some of the other points that may be well less uh, widely recognized. But let me kind of outline the obvious one. It is cash for the same reason as we are largely paid salaries or any of the fellowships and other things we are paid in cash because cash gives us a choice. And essentially you can, you can have the, uh, it, it kind of cuts some of the deadweight losses and the transactions costs in essentially reaching or targeting, uh, targeting people. The second thing is that because it's a, a percentage of nominal GDP per capita, it would be basically protected against inflation because otherwise you could well argue that you could announce any sum and that could then be uh, basically watered down by inflation. But you could also worry that there could be some populist pressures in kind of you know, having higher amounts which would then prove to be difficult. And you could also basically therefore uh, think of this as a lagged average of say the average of last few years of GDP that would kind of create a built-in kind of, you know, uh, stabilizer to what is going to be sustainable as far as um, uh, the inclusive growth dividend goes. The third uh, component, and there are many, and those who are interested, uh, I, I certainly uh, would uh, request you to take a look at our paper where we discuss uh, these things in detail and uh, discuss many other uh, aspects of uh, pros and cons of this is basically because it's targeted to the individual, it would also have positive gender empowerment effect as opposed to something that is targeted at the household level where whoever is in charge or making economic decisions of the household, which often turns out um, in, it would be, uh, would be the male head of the household, this would also uh, serve that purpose of gender empowerment. Now, there are concerns. I mean, clearly, one of the first concerns would be, would people spend the cash transfers kind of badly or wisely? Because anytime, if you think about, 
hey, what are we trying to do here? We are trying to provide safety net for the poor. And what I'm ad advocating is having unconditional cash transfers or income transfers as a part of this portfolio. You would worry that would this really be frittered away in, in, in essential consumption and therefore in some ways it would really be a wasteful policy as opposed to giving merit goods uh, to people directly such as food and other things. Now, interestingly, there is a lot of study on this in the context of uh, developing countries. And indeed, Evans and Popova of the World Bank, they have a, a really a large kind of uh, study covering several countries where they actually look at unconditional cash transfer programs carried out in various parts of the world. And also to the extent there has been an increase in what they call non-merit consumption goods or temptation goods such as alcohol, gambling, and things like that. And the evidence is minimal. So it is not the case that at the severe level of poverty, it, it may happen for some households or it may happen in some cases, but the empirical evidence doesn't suggest this to be a major concern. The second thing would be, would it have a big effect on work incentives? Well, the answer is, both developing and developed countries, there's actually no systematic evidence of various cash transfer programs having a negative effect on labor supply. Indeed, Abhijit Banerjee and his co-authors have a 2019 World Bank Research Observer piece where they look at various RCTs in various developing countries, I think six or seven, um, if I, I don't remember the number exactly. But what they find is basically uh, there is no evidence of people working less uh, because of this in the context of developing countries. Now in the developed country context, the evidence is more mixed, but even there, there is very little systematic evidence that um, having, having more ca unconditional cash transfers actually causes people to work, work less. And one of the things that one also has to keep in mind that in critiquing this kind of income transfers as potentially having this effect is, suppose, you know, clearly there's an income effect. If you have more income, you're gonna, you know, income uh, leisure is a normal good. So if you have more income, unless your subsistence needs are kind of those constraints are binding, which is more relevant in the context of developing countries, you may well argue that people might want to consume more leisure. But what often the point that is kind of neglected or misunderstood is uh, various phase out of conditional programs also have big incentive problems. And if you think of not just the income transfer or the income effect of the transfer, but the fact that the moment your income crosses a certain level, you're gonna lose some benefits, et cetera. Those two have uh, strong incentive effects. So when we are comparing kind of head to head, we should make a fair comparison and allow for some of those um, kind of you know, uh, concerns as well. So moving forward uh, in, in the, in, in, in given the uh, sort of uh, time, time constraints and also my genuine interest in engaging uh, with uh, your questions and comments, I want to now move to the second broad uh, theme that I want to mention again briefly is possible complementarities between uh, these kind of an unconditional income transfer as well uh, uh, with uh, things such as a conditional form of transfer, which of which uh, the um, uh, Manrega is a good example, because basically you are guaranteed work for 100 days and uh, only when you need it in rural areas. And therefore, this is not an unconditional form of transfer. You have to work and it is conditional on you working as well as qualifying certain um, uh, kind of, uh, uh, you have to qualify as to where you're working, what kind of work you're doing, etc. So for example, if we integrate say uh, IGD type of policy and which the numbers that uh, Kartik Muralidhar and I ad are advocating are relatively very small because 1% of GDP, if you, uh, that's the total revenue that you're advocating, then per capita, it, it only goes to a couple of hundred rupees a month really. So that's really not a big amount at all. So one solution uh, to uh, essentially um, uh, one interesting approach would be to integrate an income transfer scheme with the, uh, the kind of, you know, um, uh, Manrega, because if you think of this as welfare, the income transfer, you can think of these kind of employment guarantee as workfare, whereas essentially what it would achieve is self-targeting. 
Only those who really need the money would then be willing to work extra and earn this extra money after receiving a kind of flat amount, uh, which may be relatively small given where our per capita income is or was, and now it is uh, even in worse shape because of the current events. But Manrega is not that great for the poor who are unable to do usual manual work, for example, children, the elderly, the disabled, etc. And therefore, one could easily think of a way of combining uh, these two things with one having a flat base amount and then having something that would be a, a top up amount. And that would basically then allow people to uh, work hard. And that would also solve partly the self-selection problem as to those who need it will then basically effectively raise their hand and, and kind of uh, get, this, um, uh, get this extra amount that they would need. So basically this would make it costly for people to receive the additional income beyond the base amount. And since everyone qualifies for the flat amount, the incentive program for underreporting would also be absent. And if we, this, the IGT to receive the flat amount would enable tax authorities to bring more people in the informal sector under the tax net. That's a separate kind of fiscal uh, or public, uh, public um, finance type of advantage uh, that this kind of a scheme that could have. I want to now spend the uh, remaining few minutes I have of my uh, allocated time to talk a little bit about what are some of the lessons that the COVID crisis has thrown up, and in particular, the complementarities between the public distribution system and, and, and cash transfers. So as you can see, the title for this is in-kind and cash transfers as opposed to in-kind versus cash transfer, because that's a debate that, for example, uh, this kind of an ongoing thing as to those who advocate uh, the food distribution under the PDS versus cash transfers, et cetera, and which one is better, which one is, um, you know, the converting one into the other. There's a long debate uh, about it. So one key lesson from the unique nature of this particular crisis that we are going through, and now I'm kind of zeroing in on where we are right now or have been since March, since the uh, you know, lockdown started and uh, the pandemic was officially recognized and, and um, uh, public policy started dealing with it. That's been almost six months now. So first of all, if you think about the particular crisis, this is a twin supply and demand problem. Yeah, the supply problem is obvious that because of the lockdown, there are frictions that are created so that, you know, supply chains are disrupted both at the micro level, food reaching the grocery stores or your bazaar, versus, of course, more macro level supply chain problem as to, you know, uh, factories needing their inputs from um, intermediate inputs, etc. Now, this is the point I want to make, and it's it's not uh, not such an obvious point. So, uh, and it, it occurred to uh, me when when this problem really broke is, uh, if the supply chains are disrupted, if we just had an income transfer scheme in in hand, that's not going to be would have been good enough. Indeed, we see saw that in the context of the migrant workers as to what happened because they were many of them were outside the PDS thing because they were not in their villages, etc. So therefore, you would need some kind of a direct transfer or some kind of a direct supply of uh, basic subsistence supplies. Otherwise, you know, um, uh, this would, you know, just having cash, um, uh, whether through transfers or your income may not be kind of uh, enough. But the flip side is also true that suppose, and this is a, prob a point that has been made um, uh, since Amatya Sen's work on famine and in various contexts, that even if the supply disruption didn't happen, and suppose the public health problem is solved, which of course at this point is still uh, looking like a fairly distant prospect, but suppose magically it were to be solved, okay? Because of the overall slowdown of the economy and people losing jobs, losing their income flows, okay? Even if the shops would, would to be well stocked and supply chains would to be revived or restored, you still have a problem of uh, not having income. So therefore having both physical supplies as well as income transfer is, is, is kind of, you know, are going to be complementary policy in the context of a crisis like this. The second point I want to know, and I will wrap up very soon, um, I'm, I'm nearly done, is that 
The second point where I would say in a crisis like this, when we think about the design of the safety net, and that's really the key, key theme of the talk here, in-kind and cash transfer are also likely to be complementary because of the following reason, that in this vast economy of ours, different people are facing different sets of binding constraints. And because that's not, you know, it's not like a one thing that is uh, everybody is facing the same situation. Given this, those constraints could both be directly economic constraints they're facing, but they could also be facing various kind of access to the uh, safety net or policies that they're entitled to. Something goes wrong in, 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 the, uh, in, the, in the delivery of this. So that's another reason that because in normal times when you design these kind of safety net, you're worried about both inclusion error and exclusion error. In fact, a lot of our discourse is about inclusion error, people taking undue or unfair advantage of things that in some ways they really shouldn't be on humanitarian grounds of being poor. But in an acute crisis like this, clearly the exclusion errors are things that you should be uh, worried about more, again, as the plight of the migrant workers showed. And once again, this kind of makes the case for having a complementary package of both cash and, and, and in-kind uh, to overcome this. So essentially, uh, you know, that some recent um, studies have pointed out the glitches and frictions in the system that make any transfer policy, whether it's direct cash transfers, the Narega payments, or PDS subject to serious leakages, delays. And that's where this complementary is going to be, uh, you know, uh, important. And this is the point about the exclusion error, et cetera. And I think if you think about more the social choice foundations to this point of view, you can think about it really that in a, in a crisis like this, our social welfare function switches to a more Rawlsian function where you're worried about the welfare of the worst off. Whereas in normal times, you would have reasons to take a more utilitarian uh, kind of social welfare function where there are various kinds of trade-offs between different kinds of policies, okay? So one of the things that I want to uh, make, and I kind of really, this is my last slide, uh, is if you think about uh, the PDS, indeed normal times it's subject to many critiques of which some of which I share, but during this particular crisis, it did uh, do a very good job in terms of providing basic subsistence cover to some of the most vulnerable part of our population. And you know, indeed therefore the lesson to learn from that is if in normal times one could say, hey, compared to PDS, better forms of transfer might be uh, you know, uh, you know, more cost effective, we should keep in mind in terms of these extreme situations. And if we have a more risk averse approach to it, we can see that in these times, uh, uh, PDS provides a safety net that is robust in certain ways that cash transfers only would not be, okay? And indeed, the last point of complementarity between this, and this is something that a few others have suggested, that given that the PDS-based distribution network has been around for long, and uh, based on some surveys, it seems a more reliable uh, network to reach the very poor, one could also think about tying uh, at least some of the emergency cash relief that uh, has been sanctioned during this particular crisis to the PDS network itself, because that would essentially uh, achieve better targeting than some of the other targeting through the JDY accounts, et cetera. Anyway, I think I'm uh, done with my uh, time uh, allocation uh, and I would uh, stop here and I would let Rajesh to uh, conduct um, the Q&A and I will step in when I'm asked to answer. Thank you so much, Matrish. We have covered a lot of ground in barely 45 minutes, starting from the very basic questions about why studying poverty right over to extremely important, relevant and uh, complex questions about various channels of supporting the poor, particularly in times like these. For the Q&A, uh, I think we'll get started with three questions that were curated already. So I'll just invite three of the students to start the questions. Well, I mean, you ask the question and let the speaker respond to it and then the next person goes, while others may think of their questions uh, as these three ask the questions. The first three questions would be from Anshu Jain, Radhika Garg, and Aishwarya Krishna. Anshu, you want to ask your question? 
am i audible sir yes yes uh, good evening sir uh, but Hi. my question is what if country is passing through depression phase uh, will uh, this policy still be implemented uh especially when a country is passing through a depression phase because that's where some of the needs for this kind of support would be advocated uh, more, more on humanitarian grounds as well as if you think about the cash transfer this is a point that several people have made that would also have a, a kind of stimulus aspect to it because at some point or the other if you, if you just look at read say business papers like today live mint carried a story that one of the uh, survey of ceos that they carried out they're saying basically slackening and essentially uh, consumer demand kind of going down and uh, the government stimulus package where you know that's the kind of main concern so especially so during a depression yes okay thank you sir radhika good evening professors hello uh so my question is with the history of great level of corruption and other leakages in the economy how is reliability ensured in implementing inclusive growth dividend policy absolutely i think that's a very good question but i want to reframe this a little bit because of course corruption is a pervasive problem but if you think about the non performing assets of the indian banking system and how the rich kind of you know in some ways have effectively expropriated uh, and and kind of abused the system and so therefore i think in a lot of the discussion of the welfare i somehow feel that the discussion is a bit lopsided so i agree that corruption is a very systemic problem and something that whatever we do we need to sort of think about how 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 to deal with it but you know whether from our defense contracts to our you know how how the banking system works etc the tax concessions that corporates get you can have you can see all of these and there's a bunch written on it so with that level playing field sorted out let me answer your specific question what about this particular policy see the entire reason milton friedman who was no particular you know whatever lefty or a socialist advocating you know kind of um, a pro poor policies was one of the early supporters of an unconditional cash transfer program and if you look at uh, some of milton friedman's writing it is exactly because it will cut down on corruption because think about it what the proposal that we are pointing out essentially would give you a certain sum of money which given our fiscal realities and even the pro pre covid realities and the post covid realities are even more grim it's going to be a relatively small amount everybody will get it you will get it i will get it the very poor will get it that's why it's an unconditional cash transfer that everybody gets you see what i'm saying so of course even there there can be corruption but compared to anything that is conditional anything that is targeted the entire point of the unconditional cash transfer argument which is why more free market exponents like uh, milton friedman advocated is is precisely that it's going to be relatively less now you could well argue and i i you know i clearly like your question because you you pressed a button that is a very relevant one right because that's in a lot of our public policy this is the main concern how it will be gamed and how it it various kind of corruption will crop up that you should also think about you know a natural counter to this that how how what kind of a policies where there are kind of super rich person will get maybe this trivial amount but also a very poor person will get the same amount but the entire literature on universal basic income and there's a very you know rich tradition here uh, ranging from the right milton friedman friedrich hayek to the more left james tobin uh, robert solo etc the argument is it has to be budget balanced so in net terms the rich will be paying out and the poor will be getting it and you can see that in a very simple you know thing that suppose capital t is the total revenue that you need to fund this and what we are saying is 1% of gdp you know that you're going to give it to now of course the tax revenues will have to fund it so even though nominally everybody will get it right so long as those other funding sources are the usual amount of progressivity built into them de facto therefore there will be uh, some progressive redistribution but that's in a way the beauty of the scheme that it is an unconditional scheme but de facto it has to be budget balanced to some kind of cut in expenditure or some increase in taxes okay aishwarya hi sir good evening hi aishwarya krishna 
So my question is as a, I'm a, I'm from Kerala. I'm a Keralaite, and which is having the highest rural MPC among all the states in India. So yeah. a one percent GDP in the form of IGD, like makes up only three percent of Kerala, which is the lowest as per the above reason. So an equal distribution to every single citizen of our country puts the Keralaite at a disadvantage for no fault of his. So, isn't this proposal of equal distribution akin to penalizing us who have worked hard earlier to raise our standard of living? So, how can that's, this be addressed, sir? Sure, sure. That's a great question, uh, and indeed, the Kerala model, especially you know during the COVID crisis, is something that uh, other states can certainly learn from, and its social indicators um, are are obviously uh, uh, very impressive. So, but let me come to your question uh, in a straightforward way. Suppose we didn't do this policy. Given how our fiscal federalism works under the various finance commissions, how you know revenues are distributed, Kerala will always be uh, cross-subsidizing UP and Bihar. That's the reality. So even if you suppose I took the policy out of the table, I. So the point is, to the extent that you sign up for a certain degree of fiscal federalism, there will be some de facto redistribution between states. Okay, so that is you could say that 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 is part of the. Uh, federal aspect of the government, and you know whether uh, you know uh, whether this degree of redistribution across state is happening optimally or not. That's a very valid question. So, therefore, my point is, anything that is at a it's like there are state taxes and then there are federal taxes, central government taxes, right? So, there's nothing that is stopping yeah. Kerala, right, from having an extra top up to those who are resident of Kerala, okay compared to whatever is the common amount that uh, every state gets. My point being, whatever inequality you're pointing out, that has already happened because of the, how the tax revenues are shared. And I'm not even getting into this whole debate about GSP re GST revenues being withheld, et cetera, some of the current debates that are going on. But you see the point I'm, I'm making that out of the total tax pool, the richer states are already cross-subsidizing the poorer states. We are just saying that out of that expenditure, you do it in this way. But that, in some ways, whatever you do, even if you build a bridge or you buy you know, more defense equipment, effectively Kerala is paying more than uh, Kerala and Maharashtra and, and, and some of the richest states are paying more. Great, thanks. Amarinder Singh, do you want to ask the question in person? Because the question is there in the chat. But if you want to just ask it. Sorry, I haven't looked at the chat. So do- uh, no, 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 I, I am the chat. I mean, unless Amarinder asks, I can read out the question. Okay. okay. But I'm just checking if Amrinda wants to ask it himself. All right. The uh, good evening, Professor. Yeah. Hi. Go ahead. Hi there. Yeah. Uh, so my question has been uh, is regarding UCT. Uh, uh, so uh, generally, the uh, independence, what the government of India has been doing is been establishing institutions like uh, educational ones, healthcare ones, and the PDS itself. Uh, don't you think the UCT will draw the recipients away from these institutions or schemes? Sorry, what is UCT? Hey, uh, Universal Cash Transfer. ICT. I oh, oh, okay, I, we are calling it Inclusive Growth Development, but yeah, no, I mean, the acronym doesn't matter. So, sorry. So, your question is, uh, uh, this will take away revenue from other things? Yes, it, it will draw the investment away from the other things and... Uh, especially from these institutions, which are for the uh, general public, including all the people. And don't you think these institutions should be strengthened further and uh, the poor people need to be incentivized to uh, have better participation in these, in these institutions? No, I don't think so. No, I mean, just to go back to, um, you know, what I said at the very beginning, I believe in a portfolio approach to uh, the problem of poverty. And I think there are compelling evidence from various countries as well as within India that a cash or income transfer component should be part of it. What an inclusive growth dividend does is it creates an incremental amount. So it's 1% of GDP. So consider, you know, right now we are living in a very dismal economic and public health scenario, but think of a growing economy. Yeah, if you target something about 1% of GDP towards something, you're basically saying as GDP grows, your tax revenue for that area grows. You're not taking away money from the other, other areas, right? So this is just a commitment, for example, uh, various other countries have about some particular cess. They are now tax system, you have an education cess, right? So we are merely saying that a say, poor 
person who's handicapped in a village where you know uh, you're basically saying that hey that we have pds and we have other things so we are not going to advocate a cash transfer so i i completely i disagree with that point of view so just to summarize where i disagree i think a portfolio of policies should have a cash transfer component we can debate how much that i'm completely happy uh, to have a discussion about that is worth discussing so uh, and number 2 any policy that you advocate will have to be subject to overall budget constraint so i could flip the question and then ask this that if you had whatever policies you advocate you could argue that hey even if you look at our health and education sector budget you know where most of the money goes to it goes to payment of salaries you know what what is happening to the public you know education or health system in terms of absenteeism and some of the other things that for example my co-author um, uh, kartik and others are pointing out so my point again in a constructive tone would be 1% of gdp is a small number right so why don't we view it as an index fund like in you know investment you have this concept of a index fund yeah and then if for example some state the other services are doing so well they would have the option to say hey i would rather uh, this money goes to that as opposed to going to this form of cash transfer so i really think this kind of uh, no cash transfer is an extreme position as much as if the cash transfer folks said we should minimize say pds or we should minimize employment guarantee i would say that that would be you know again to the extent you're an economic student um think about why we have interior solutions so typically we don't pick corner solutions because of certain you know uh, reasons of how our preferences and how the underlying production possibilities are right so my point simply is a portfolio of policies for the uh, poor and in particular the safety net ought to have and i'll ask you one simple question and again it's a good question and that's why you know you've gotten a long answer out of this is ask any of the migrant workers that hey would you like uh, would you would you would you have preferred a cash transfer or not because cash is essential especially when markets are in disarray or often in remote areas you know so i think some 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 i think that that exactly makes the case for the cash transfer right the next question is about uh, about likelihood of this happening politically or otherwise this is from my colleague dr chitresh kumar who's not in the not in this uh, room call right now so chitresh asks we have not been able to push our healthcare expenditure to beyond 4% while it should be much more Come, uh, keeping that in mind creating 1% of the gdp for igd isn't it too much of an ask no it's not uh, for the you know I, i take the point about the healthcare and indeed right now we are living in the public health crisis of the century or more and therefore i'm i have no once again i really avoid this debates about it's like i never have a fight between apples and oranges and tea and coffee because i like them all uh, similarly i really don't have this fight be, you know i am a big supporter of public health expenditure i'm a big supporter of public education expenditure too why should we not right i mean these are all specific market failure or specific public goods failure that's why you need public expenditure on it but let me come to your specific question yes right now our fiscal situation is a mess but as many have pointed out unless the economy starts growing the mess will just only deepen so if we just tighten our fists right now and this is something from raghuraj and to many others have pointed out that this is a classic keynesian point that when you have a kind of contractionary situation then our immediate impulse is to tighten you know belts but that can never be a a the thing to get out of the rut but to your specific question there's a recent uh, paper by sudipto mandal uh, and and shatrudra shikdar which looks at various non merit subsidies that exist in the you know indian budget they have um, uh, two recent pieces in ideas for india and as well as an epw article in the last um, uh, year within the last year or so where they look at budget items very carefully and there are lots of you know such items from which you could extract more surplus yeah uh, to be spent on various things so that addresses your broad question that there are ways in which things can be funded now of the things that can be funded who can advocate against public health spending at the moment when we are indeed facing the public health crisis of the century but having said that i do not buy this fiscal pessimism overall and i'm not talking about the immediate crisis 
there are lots of ways in which you can, you know, um, uh, there are articles that I've written. Uh, I mentioned the Mandal Sigdar already, but S. Subramaniam has written extensively on some of the corporate tax waivers that, um, that uh, happen every year and what percentage of the budget it adds up to. So clearly a more transparent uh, fiscal system would have more revenue available for various kinds of public expenditure, whether for the poor or for the general public. And I don't again see the need as much as, you know, um, if we uh, at the household level, should we fight over whether we should buy more rice or more lentils? I think we should get more, uh, you know, by both. Uh, how much would depend on our preferences and the prices, et cetera. And sorry, last comment in the paper, the PM Kisan, which is a direct cash transfer program, okay? It's of course not unconditional because you have to be a farmer, right? That is already 0.5% of GDP. So that has already been allocated. And in fact, one of the ways we benchmark our proposal is you just make it universal. You just double the allocation for that. One quick question from Rochishnu Das here. He says, can the, can the record high levels of foreign, uh, foreign exchange reserves play a role in funding this? I, you know, as, as we, as we kind of know that what's, uh, you know, the foreign uh, res reserves that we have here are not necessarily a sign of health here, right? I mean, because essentially the economy is in contraction, imports have gone down, and therefore, you know, some uh, of the foreign currency reserves have, have kind of accumulated. Having said that, I would kind of, you know, I, I have some ambivalence as to what are the forms in which we essentially get out of this fiscal mess because you know I, I think anybody has to be very sympathetic to what uh, what the kind of current policy makers the numbers they're looking at at the precipitous fall in, in tax revenue the GST imbroglio that's going on etc so sure i mean whether we use uh, uh, these kind of um, uh, these uh, reserves or whether we sell off certain uh, loss-making um, uh, kind of assets that the government has. I am fairly open to all these ideas. So let me not make a specific uh, comment as to, because then we'll have to figure out how much of the money that we'll uh, bring in and so on. But I think all options should be on the table, especially to get out of the uh, specific mess uh, we are right now and other countries are facing um, this as well. So Amlan Dasgupta asks, this is a quantity question, I think, isn't it a problem that when the economy is doing badly and poor are more in need of support, the IGD will be lower if it is indexed to GDP? Sure, yeah, that's the problem of, you know, this is like in standard incentive theory, you basically try to balance between risk and incentives. That's the core lesson from incentive theory, right? That if you give people too much insurance, they will not work. And if you give them too much sharp incentives, they're exposed to too much risk. So what the IGD is a form of a dividend on overall national income. So therefore, when the economy is doing well, you're basically giving, uh, uh, giving more. Um, and when the economy is not doing very well, you're giving less. You could well argue that you should have a kind of progressive growth dividends or, or uh, so when the economy is doing badly, the, uh, this thing should go up. I feel to the extent during a recession, you need to come up with other packages, you can do that. But I, I still would think that a kind of linear thing balances this idea or creates this idea of, you know, because otherwise what you're saying is why not have a more non-linear uh, formula for if suppose this is why, and then what will be this uh, uh, inclusive growth dividend would in general be a non-linear function of y as opposed to uh, some constant uh, t that we are proposing to be 1%. And you're exactly right that ideally you want in a recession the poor to get more, et cetera. But I would kind of say that, you know, yes, we can, we can, uh, we can think about uh, more and more complex schemes. But one of the things that I, I feel, and one of the reasons why I have a, a piece that I just completed with a LSE colleague on the British uh, the prospect of a UBI in Britain and using those numbers, and uh, it will be up on my website soon, is basically 
flat taxes or simple taxes and subsidies have certain properties that can be kind of less uh, subject to gaming. Okay, so because otherwise I think uh, the same thing uh, that we would see um, uh, in terms of uh, various uh, expenditure items in nominal terms, that there could be populist biases that could creep in, right? Therefore, you could just say that before the election, somehow uh, people could just use this um, inflation indicators to suddenly have more money to the poor, and then they would be happy with the incumbent government, etc. Cut a long story short, I would say I, my instinct would be to keep simple things simple and a 1% IGD based on our fiscal realities pre-COVID uh, is what I'm comfortable with. Thank you. Maybe the last question goes to uh, Suryansh who raised his hand. If you can ask Suryansh yourself, not in the chat. Hi, Prof. Uh... Hi. Uh, hi, Professor. Uh, you have already partially answered it, but I was wondering, like, the economy is already cash trapped, and you have uh, mentioned uh, that we have to not raise extra funds, but reject the existing ones. You mentioned defense. Defense can be a tricky one, considering we are always in a border standoff. So sure. how much how much do you think we should, because we have a government which is obsessed to the fiscal deficit, how much do you think we should, uh, you know, uh, stick to our physical deficit limits because physical deficit should not rise. That is a given in economics. But considering uh, how we are right now, we are already in a degrowth. Uh, we have contracted as an economy. We don't have funds. In a happier economic day, this could have been more easier. But how much do you think we should stick to the physical deficit targets? Look, I would say my general answer is that this is the time when all the stop signs should be pulled out. Okay, but having said that, I do uh, believe that there are um, uh, sort of you know very uh, distinguished macroeconomists who have done much more thinking in terms of you know what is would be kind of uh, appropriate given this current situation. But uh, I generally agree with the general thrust of what you are saying that in a situation where the economy is really contracting, we are really talking now about a growth rate, which in a recent uh, uh, piece I mentioned that, uh, you know, we shouldn't call, talk about negative growth rates as much. We should not be talking about positive contraction rates when the growth rate turns positive again, right? So basically what we have is a contraction rate of roughly 10%. Given this, I, I agree with you that this kind of fiscal uh, rigidity that we, you know, that really should go out of the window. And based on what I read from a range of very eminent monetary economists and macroeconomists, I think there's broader support in terms of taking a more, um, uh, what can you say, a less rigid approach to fiscal um, uh, deficits um, uh, given where things are. Because again, whether it's the private sector, whether it's a service of the poor, et cetera, the economy is severely uh, cash constrained in terms of, and that is preventing also, it's having second order and third order rounds of demand contraction, right? And that is causing the you know, overall uh, contraction to be even more. This is again, kind of Keynesian economics 101. So I agree with you that it's not a, a pleasant, uh, it's not the arithmetic here is not pleasant. Whatever you do, what are you gonna do? You're gonna have to either monetize the deficit, right? Or you're gonna have to, have future taxes, you know, when things turn to normal to kind of pay for some of this, or you're going to have to think of other sources of taxes or selling of assets, et cetera, and including the, um, you know, some of the comments that came earlier. But yes, my general thrust would be, yes, if there was a time to ignore the fiscal uh, deficit um, rule that the government has been focusing on, this is uh, uh, one of those times. And by rules, I mean the formula, the whatever the certain percentage of the, you know, the, which has already been breached. I think right now it stands at eight or nine percent anyway. And then uh, possibly with the COVID, it's going to shoot up to maybe 13, 14 percent. Uh, so that's already happening given what's happening to tax revenues and so on. So I had said, I had said the previous question would be the last, but there is one question from my colleague Anand Sharma, if you have time, it says, well, sure, sure, sure. what is the rationale of the one person? Why is it one? How did you choose that number one? What is it based on? Because it's clearly not going to be sufficient in some sense. Whatever you choose is probably not yeah, yeah, yeah. sufficient. No, uh, yeah, no, fair enough. I, I, I think 
one and only one reason. First of all, you know, one is a nice number. Uh, second of all, you know, uh, the um, uh, the left has this uh, movement, the you know top one percent, whatever. So in a way, we could revert it. But these are all light-hearted answers. These are not serious answers. The serious answer to your question would be, it is pretty much dictated by the fiscal reality. So the way we extrapolate it is to the PM Kisan. We looked at the numbers. We looked at the amount of, you know, whether you like this or not, suppose for whatever else, suppose for emergency public health, you need to raise money. Our calculations suggest that up to 1%, again, leaving aside the current fiscal mess, which, you know, in the end, I still do believe is a short run one, because eventually the, you know, public health problem will come to some kind of resolution and then the economy will eventually recover when, how, how painful those are things that none of us know here. But coming back to it, it was based on the fiscal realities and the, some of the studies I indicated, we felt that was a relatively conservative amount which you could pick where um, nobody could say uh, this can't be done. But of course, you are between, it's the classic, you're between the uh, you know, a rock and a hard place because if, you know, one percent is too little. In some of the early writings on UBI, some of us calculated if you, if you just wanted to give people the poverty line level income, that shoots it to 10 percent, which is clearly impractical. So now maybe we should apply some kind of a theorem of continuity that if one is too little and 10 is too much, uh, maybe, you know, there is a, a point uh, that would be, and, you know, I'll, I'll, I, I don't have any problem with that. I mean, if it's 2% or 5, you know, 5%, I'm okay with that. But once again, look, we have a general, general problem that in some ways is, you know, it's universal. I mean, it's not like whether you believe in my policy advocacy or not, the fiscal reality is what it is. Similarly, the portfolio approach, it's hard to dodge the, you know, that's a general point that it's really hard to uh, disagree with. You may disagree on what should be the relative size of the components, but the fact that we need a portfolio approach is also true. Then we are just doing the classic, uh, you know, optimization subject to uh, scarce resources, and somebody could well come up with the number of 2% or 3%. The net result of all of this, for instance, whatever we do and practically whatever reality allows us to do, not going to move away from the 30%, 70% poverty numbers that you quoted right at the beginning anytime soon, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And in fact, our worry is, and I hope all of us shared this, and I know, uh, you know, because it's, it's very palpable, is this pandemic has really, and the lockdown has impoverished, uh, you know, a large number of people. And this, if there was any moment that we should leave aside our usual uh, policy preferences and so on, and really worry about the problem that the poor face, we are all facing some problem or the other, but the very poor, uh, you know, are really facing it. And like, like Rajesh was saying, that that is, that is something we should always keep in mind. And that's where my approach is to be fairly agnostic as to whatever works. And that's why I pointed out some of the complementarities between income transfer and some of the other things. But yes, whatever we are reading in the media about what's happening to the rural poor, et cetera, I think it's something of a, a truly grim situation. Thank you so much, Maitrish, dealing for dealing with this large and complex matter in such a detailed manner and patiently taking our questions, going 15 minutes beyond the budgeted time. We're really, really grateful to you for this wonderful webinar. And we look forward to hosting you physically in better times, hopefully soon, at our Sonipat campus. Thank you again. Thank you very much, Rajesh, and, and, and thank you uh, for, for uh, inviting me. And it was um, stimulating the questions and the back and forth. So as, as argumentative Indians, I think one of the things I truly miss about being back in India and having these kind of discussions face to face over cups of tea and coffee, et cetera, is really having these brainstorming sessions. So I look forward to having one on site uh, when but better time, times return. So do take care, everybody, and thanks for your um, uh, questions and, and attention. Thank you.